so glad that you are here. Now would be a good time to silence your cell phones because we are recording Dr. Barron's talk. We cannot video record his images because some of these images are copyrighted, but you will be able to go to the Wade website to access his talk later without the images. Let me introduce you to Dr. Andrew Barron. He is the director of Jews for Jesus Canada, and he lives in Toronto with his wife and three children. With an MA in Missiology from Fuller Seminary in California and a D-Min in Anthropology from the University of Toronto, Andrew periodically serves, as many people in this room know, as an adjunct professor of missiology and anthropology at Moody Bible Institute in Chicago. And that's why we were able to get him here tonight, because he is teaching cla his class there. Before he did graduate work, however, Dr. Barron was part of a very different kind of mission work. Having earned a BA in space science at Florida Institute of Technology, he worked in Denver as a crew activity planner and orbit designer on early space shuttle missions. How appropriate then that he will be talking tonight about Joy Davidman Gresham, who became interested in C.S. Lewis after reading his novels about space missions. Only they were space missions to Malacandra and Paralandra. Like Joy Davidman, Andrew was born into a Jewish family, but he came to recognize Jesus as the Messiah when he encountered a Jewish Holocaust survivor in Denver who had become a Christian and was leading a Bible study. So this is an incredible opportunity to be learning from Dr. Barron about Joy Davidman, who married one of the most famous Christians in the 20th century. A note before we begin, I want to or invite you to come back and join us on August 1st, where we're going to have the artist responsible for this Aslan painting, and we've had posters made up of it. It's right out in the foyer of this auditorium. It is an intriguing painting. She'll talk about her process, and especially her discovery that was pointed out to her that she had put a sacrificial lamb into the painting without planning on it. So it's gonna be a fascinating talk that is 7 p.m. on Thursday, August 1st. So write that down into your calendars. And now with no further ado, join me in welcoming Dr. Andrew Barron. Thank you. Thank you so much. Shalom. Shalom. Thank you for welcoming me here. What a great privilege and an opportunity. I'm Andrew Barron. I'm the director of Jews for Jesus in Canada. And I've been on a great journey here at Wade learning more about Joy Davidman and her Jewish imagination. Three years ago, I read Abby's biography of Joy Davidman. And towards the end of the biography, Abby just casually mentions a quote from Joy as she writes a letter to her husband about the fact that she was going to speak at a church in London, 1953-1954, about her experiences as a Jewish believer in Jesus. And then the paragraph goes on and she talks about something else. And I was flabbergasted. There was no footnote. The sermon was not recorded in the footnote, and I started going back and forth and back and forth in the book, wondering where I could find this sermon, and it wasn't there. So I wrote to Abby, I wrote to Doug Gresham, I wrote to the Wade Center, I wrote to every C.S. Lewis Society that there was. <laughs> I was incredulous. Where was this sermon preached in 1953 by this wonderful Jewish believer in Jesus? And all I could find out was that if anybody had it, 
it would be here. And so my treasure hunt continued. I went to the University of Toronto library system. I looked around. I spent about six months searching for it. All I could find was that it, if it was anywhere, it was here. So I made an appointment and an application to come here <coughs> for two days. I wasn't very hopeful. The people who wrote back to me said, well, they think it's here, but we're not sure. Doug Gresham said, he thinks it's here, but we're not sure. <laughs> Elaine Hooker, the library here, said, we think it's here, but we're not sure, right? So I came here. At, at, as soon as the doors opened, I came in, and I was greeted by 10 boxes of letters. <laughs> and about three hours later, I just was looking and looking and looking, and I saw a folder. And on the folder, it said, chosen for what? I said, that's interesting. And I opened it up, and there it was. And Elaine, I don't know if you remember, but I jumped up in that office right there, and there were a bunch of people doing research, and I jumped up, and I said, I found it! <laughs> 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 and then Elaine got up, and she came to me, and her arms were open wide, and she gave me this big hug, and it was like she was crying, and she said, it's usually not that exciting around here. <laughs> 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 and, and I read this sermon, and it was just amazing, and I spent the next day just reading all of her papers. I came back the next day, and I read all of her papers, and I came back the next year, and I read everything that I could find about Joy Davidman, the Jew for Jesus. And I submit to you that you can't really understand Joy without understanding her Jewish imagination. She was a Jew. She died very young. She was 45 years old. She was a poet. She was a humanist. She was a communist. <laughs> she was a nonconformist. She was active in New York literary circles. She was a real piece of work. <laughs> to those who knew her, she was abrasive, animated, demanding, ambitious. All these are words that I found here at Wade written by people about her who knew her. Intelligent, insubordinate, <laughs> vain. She had a tart tongue. She was striking. She was aggressive. She was a prodigy. She was critical, analytical, intimidating, radical, and obsessive. What a piece of work she must have been. <laughs> to us, she was a Jew who became a follower of Jesus. And also, importantly for us, she was the intellectual, spiritual, and marital partner of C.S. Lewis. She just grabbed his heart. Some basics. She was a Jew from the Bronx in New York City. She grew up inside a very intense Jewish subculture that formed her Jewish imagination. I say that she's a woman with a Jewish head. She grew up as a Jew. She thought as a Jew. She wrote as a Jew. She did research as a Jew. She thought like a Jewish person. Her thoughts were expressed in ways that to me, <laughs> and I hope that to you, are clearly Jewish. If you read Davidman, read her, understanding that she has a Jewish head, and I think that it will open up a whole new world to you when you read things about David Min and by David Min. Her heart was profoundly conflicted throughout her life about her Jewish identity, before she became a believer in Jesus and after. Very ambivalent, very conflicted, and if you read the things that she wrote, you can see that very clearly. Her relationship with the identity of her forefathers was intensely and overwhelmingly complicated. Many Jewish people are familiar with this ongoing struggle, this ambivalence towards our relationship with our Jewish people and with Judaism. Her, she didn't lead a traditional Jewish life. She didn't have a traditional Jewish education. She didn't go 
to Jewish school growing up. There's no evidence of that, that she had any kind of formal Jewish education. Her parents, though, were Yiddish-speaking refugees from Eastern Europe. And so she grows up inside this very intense Jewish, Yiddish-speaking home. And she was conversant in the philosophical and scholarly Judaism of medieval Western Europe because of the influence of the family that she grew up with. Her Jewishness was inherited this way. Her worldview was intensely and profoundly Jewish from her family. Her mind was oriented in a Jewish way. She simply identified as a Jew. That's who she was. In a very interesting movie that you might have seen, Shadowlands, Anthony Hopkins plays C.S. Lewis. And we have a little bit of insight into Lewis and David Min in this clip. <laughs> a woman has had a dream about me. She writes to ask if I've had a dream about her. Huh. <laughs> I had a strange dream last night. Another letter from Mrs. Gresham? I can't remember any of it. The Jewish communist Christian American? Mm. You may ask me. I know it was strange if I've forgotten it. Can't answer that one. I like her letters. She can be quite sharp sometimes. Listen to this morning. She says, I can't decide whether you'd rather be the child caught in the spell or the magician casting it. See, her letters are rather unusual. She writes as if she knows me somehow. Still, I suppose there is something of me in my books, isn't there? Oh. I expect it's just the American style. Americans don't understand about inhibitions. Ah, she's coming to England. Now she's coming to Oxford. She wants to meet us. Well, she can't come here. She knows, of course not. But she does suggest tea in a hotel. Well, tea is safe. Her hotel is safe. Oh, she might be mad. No, I don't think so. She does write poems. Poems? She should be barking. Oh, I've been at Maudlin since 1925. It is beautiful here. How old is it? The college was founded very nearly 500 years ago. Not all the buildings are that old, of course. My room was there. That's the new building. New, huh? 1733. <laughs> what does your husband do, Mrs. Gresham? Oh, Bill? Bill's a writer. Oh. And uh, you too, Jack, tell me. You call him Jack? I never liked the name Clive. <laughs> oh, well, if you're a Jack. What? No, you look fine for a Jack. <laughs> Thank you. Well, Jewish, but not Jewish-Jewish, if you can follow that. I mean, I'm a Christian, but I was brought up to be a good atheist. An atheist? Don't sound so shocked. I'm not. I was an atheist once. You? So we're both yeah. lapsed atheists? Yes, but I was never a communist. Why not? What do you mean, why not, Mrs. Griffith? Well, I mean, back in 38, it seemed to me there was only two choices. Either you were a fascist and you conquered the world, or you were a communist and you saved it. Is that so? Oh. I must have been otherwise engaged at the time. Oh. oh, there's a world worth saving. So you can see a, a little bit of her stridency, a little bit of her wit, a little bit of her sharpness. But the thing that I like the best about it, you might not have noticed this, is that when Lewis is taking the sugar out of the sugar uh, holder, he spills half of it on the, floor, on the, on the uh, uh, t desk and half of it goes into the cup. I thought that was kind of funny. I wonder if he really did that. Does anybody know that? Yeah. <laughs> Lewis said that Joy Davidman's work comes from her race. So Lewis said that basically, in, in kind of an old-fashioned sort of way, Lewis writes like a Jew. The converted Jew is the only normal human being in the world. I like that. <laughs> this is written in David Min's uh, introduction. Uh, uh, Lewis writes this in, in the introduction to Smoke on the Mountain, in which he's trying to say that a Jew 
who believes in Jesus is the most normal person in the world because he he's a descendant of Abraham by faith and a descendant of Abraham by flesh. Joy's dispositions are different but complementary. She was different. She thought like a Jew, but they were complementary because she believed in Jesus. She found Jesus as the home base for her Jewishness. And that's what happens when a Jew comes to Christ. They find Jesus as home, the fulfillment of the law and the prophets, the Redeemer of Israel. Lewis Lyke enjoys writing and thinking to the Jewish prophets. He compares her analysis of sin and idolatry, idolatry to Jeremiah in its fierceness. So she says that she writes in a way that's fierce in accordance with the writings of Jeremiah and other prophets. This is what Lewis said. She's no more inhibited than her ancestors about diagnosis. One might frankly say about denunciation. So you see that she writes very stridently about her own people and she says that she feels the liberty to do so because she's a Jew. This presentation is going to reflect on the development and the presence and the significance of all of this, of Joy's Jewish imagination. I'm going to trace the Jewish themes and thought throughout Joy's life and work. And the point is that you can't understand Joy apart from this. Her childhood, a Jewish imagination kindled, her Jewish imagination in poetry and prose. She was a prodigy early on in writing poetry. When a Jewish imagination meets politics, she became a communist. A Jewish imagination meets its match when she finds Lewis and Jesus. A Jewish imagination and questions of identity, putting eternal wrestling into words. So she struggles with her Jewish identity and her faith in Jesus as the Messiah of Israel. Jewish imagination and a rational return to righteousness. She writes deeply and profoundly about her sense of outrage about the world. A Jewish mother and son, a clash of imagination and identity. Terrible conflict with her son David, who remained an Orthodox Jew. And finally, her legacy. Her childhood. My parents held desperately to a faith against terror. So they left Eastern Europe, a place that was no friend of the Jewish people, a no friend of the Jews, for fear of pogroms and anti-Semitism and terror and death. And they ended up in the Bronx in New York City in a Jewish subculture, a pluralistic subculture, faith against terror. Her father arrived in 1892. My grandmother arrived from the very same area in 1904. She ended up in the Bronx and her parents ended up in the Bronx so that we could have been neighbors. Her Juda his Judaism, her father's Judaism, collapsed in a multicultural environment. And so he had a choice. His choice was never apparent before when he lived in Eastern Europe, but now that he lived in America, he had opportunity, he had choice, and his Judaism just collapsed. And this is what she wrote about it. We kept a vague and well-meaning belief in a vaguely well-meaning God. <laughs> this is the kind of writer that she was. Very, very pointed. Very, very smart, right? Very, very intelligent writing. She said, I was raised in a room where you can't sit, stand, or lie down. <laughs> Have you ever any of you had that experience growing up? Because that was my experience. It was a very intense two-family home. There were parents and children and grandparents and aunts and uncles in and out every day. You never know when one was coming and one was going. The dinner table was a constant fight and debate. In my home, if you didn't fight, it meant that you didn't care. <laughs> and that's what her life was like growing up. I'm a second generation American. She was a first generation American. My grandparents came from Poland. Her parents came from Poland. Eventually, she said, they came to see Judaism as absurd. The family abandoned the faith of their childhood and embraced an alternate secular faith in rationalism and socialism. And this is fairly common in a later Enlightenment Jewish society that moves from a very cloistered and closed Jewish society to an open and liberal and secular and multifaceted society where Jews and Gentiles and people of other religions live together. America had replaced my ancestral Judaism with other spiritual values. 
The framework of anti-Semitism of her day was profound and affected her deeply. It was social, it was educational and financial. Jews were not being hired. They weren't being accepted in some schools or accepted to membership in certain social clubs. And this was especially profound for Joy's brother who couldn't get into the medical school that he wanted to get into because he was Jewish. You cannot understand Joy without understanding the wickedness of anti-Semitism in New York City. And this was her sister-in-law, Mary Ellen Gresham. And so she said, we simply assimilated to get along. Her father earned a living teaching Jews to lose their accents. <laughs> I think this is fascinating. It's very, very interesting. I had never heard of anything like that until I read that in her biography. They avoided the otherness of being Jewish. Okay, so that's very, very important to understand, that she didn't want to be seen as other. She didn't want to be seen as somebody who was different. The dinner table, she said, was tense and stormy. And I can really relate to that. That's my dinner table. Always fighting, always debating, always challenging. There was always something to fight about. And that was her dinner table. She decided to be an atheist when she was eight. <laughs> she broke the scale on an IQ test in elementary school. She was really smart. Beauty I knew existed, but God, of course, did not. <laughs> 14 years old, she wrote that. If there is no God, nothing is wrong. I believe in nothing, 16 years old. She thought very, very deeply and strongly and intensely about everything. She was ambivalent about the theological and ethical foundations of Judaism. She said it's as if you kept the top floor of the house and tore down the first. <laughs> Fantasy literature attracted her because they make goodness attractive. So you can see very early on the seeds of what would attract her to Lewis. Imagination and poetry. And so she studies at Hunter College in Manhattan. This is from the yearbook. Do your part to keep undefiled your heritage. Whether native or adopted, learn English syntax, build correct sentences. Now this doesn't seem to make any sense. But this ambivalence was deep down. It was in the soil which Joy's Jewish imagination and identity had already taken root. Keep your heritage, but lose your heritage. <laughs> this conflict was part and parcel of Joy's Jewish imagination for all of her life. In 1938, she became a communist. She was 23. She takes a party name, Nell Tolchin, the name of the birthplace of her mother, a Jewish village in the Ukraine. 1940, she writes a novel, Anya, about a Ukrainian Jew, largely based on her family, on her relatives. She wrote Apostate in 1934 about a Jewish girl in Russian village who was baptized in order to marry a Russian. She writes, Chanya wondered what made her a Jew. She could not feel anything in her body that belonged to the synagogue and the law. If she was baptized by the priest and lived with Ivan and ate a pig, her body would still be Chanya. We can see some of Joy's questions about her own history and identity reflected in the struggle of the hero of the book. Joy is the hero. She's talking about herself. She's still going to be Jewish, even if she eats a pig, even if she marries a Gentile, even if she gets baptized. But this is 1934. She was a young woman. She hadn't considered Jesus yet. But she thought very hard and strong about her own Jewish identity and the fact that she was utterly and completely connected to her Jewish ancestors. She said, I will always be a Jew. She wins the English prize at Hunter for this short story. She's 19. She was really smart. <laughs> she writes Jews of No Man's Land in 1938. 
identifying with the despondency of her people. She captures their anguish. Now this is 1938, this is early. She writes Poland to the right and to the left, Sudetenland. This is a place where Jews were compressed in between Poland and Germany. Snarled at by two frontiers. We Jews are houseless. So this notion of homelessness, that theme is going to continue. Without value, without use, we are here. Remember us. You who pity us, you who are troubled by our names. You who are troubled by the fact that we are Jews. She's reflecting on the Jewish experience of exile and homelessness, right? Especially under the yoke of foreign empires. And she always reflects on what it means to be chosen. She says, what are we chosen for? We are chosen for trouble. So she's thinking deeply and hard and intensely about being Jewish. Then she writes this, our veins possess variations, our blood marches to different tunes. You might distrust me, you might be afraid. You clinging fog, you coward to eat the body, eat the body out and leave my sound flesh corroded. So she's writing to Arians. She's suggesting that the whole Aryan ethos could be regarded as a clinging fog. Very intense words, right? Very strident, very harsh, very intelligent, very disruptive, very rebellious. Trojan women in the smoke and screaming air, they got across the bridges with their children, carrying their household goods and silverware. Hurry, hurry, death flows at your heels like a hissing wave, chasing the children up the sand. Times we went to the beach, Coney Island was the first place they landed. Coney Island was a famous beach in New York City where a lot of Jewish immigrants went to. For the Nazis, she writes, heckling Hitler, while you rave, can you see now the depth of your own grave? The Ballad of a Jew's Daughter, 1954, the tale of the Jew's daughter who sat in a box of bone, windowless, lightless, deaf and blind, spinning the silk of her spider mind into a new to catch the wind, Christ came to the Jew's daughter in her dark mind alone. And so she's finding her voice during this time. She's angry. She's articulate. She's passionate. She is spiritually hungry, isn't she? She uses landmarks in Jewish history and thought to express herself, to express this sense of injustice as well as camaraderie with her own people. She's an intense thinker, an intense writer. She knows how to use words, doesn't she? She admits that during this time she had a deep interest in Jesus. But she was conflicted as a Jew about the attraction. So she was attracted and repulsed at the same time. She writes that cold chills would proceed from the mention of his name. She was surrounded by anti-Semitic sentiment in the neighborhood that she lived and grew up in. She interpreted Jesus' will for her to mean beatings, burnings, and marginalization. She assumed that's what the people of Jesus did to Jews. They beat them. They marginalized them. She bur they burned us. She read the New Testament and found something completely different. <laughs> she was confused by the discrepancy between the words of Jesus and the behavior of those who said they follow him. She was simultaneously drawn to the former and repulsed by the latter. She was falling in love with Jesus and she despised Christians. <laughs> Speaking of herself, she said, surely a poor Jew may be pardoned a little confusion. The cross appears quite regularly in her poetry. So if you pick up Don King's book about her poetry, you'll see the cross there on a regular basis. Her first published poem was called Resurrection, a private argument with herself and Jesus. This is the kingdom that you find. This is the power that you hold. And I think what she's saying is this. How can a king promise a redeemed life in an unredeemed world? This is the paradox of the kingdom. We're asked to live redeemed lives in an unredeemed world. Where is the kingdom of God, she says. Where is it? 
Is it here? Is it not here? Is it now? Is it not yet? It's both. We have to live redeemed lives in an unredeemed world. And she's dealing with this. She became a communist because she was working for heaven on earth. Her writing at this time echoes the Hebrew prophets who charged with this task. It's called tikkun olam, or repair of the world. She thought that she was acting in this tradition of repairing the world in accordance with the writing of the prophets. She helped to draft a pamphlet listing anti-Semitic people and publications that quote them. This was part of her mission of repair. But eventually she became delusioned with the Communist Party. And what she felt was this corrupt philosophy and this kind of self-absorbed interest. Joy was aware that the Hebrew prophets condemned the human heart as sick, wicked, ill-equipped to carry out this mission of repairing the world of tikkun olam. If we're at war with our own heart, we'll be at war with those around us. And she perceived the silence of God and his inaction in the face of prosperity of the wicked as a constant refrain of the prophets. So all of this was churning around inside of her. This interrogatory nature of the relationship of the prophets and God fits well within Joy's own framework. Judaism is not afraid of this. It's not afraid to question God, to interrogate God, to question his justice. It's not afraid to embrace this ambiguity. And Joy does this on a regular basis, often and quite well. Joy didn't want to believe in the supernatural, but she was fascinated by it. She wanted it, though, to be written as fiction. And you can see, again, seeds of what eventually would become her attraction to Lewis. She loved the idea of heaven if it was represented as a fairy story. <laughs> and so a Jewish imagination meets its match. Her interest in fantasy leads her to Lewis. She writes, he writes on themes that find itself within the Jewish imagination, particularly this very important idea of home. Very important. She yearned for this place that she called desire. So here's a quote. There's a myth that has always haunted mankind, the legend of the way out, the door leading out of time and space into somewhere else, we all go out of that door eventually, calling it death. But the tale persists that for a few lucky ones, the door has swung open before death, letting them through. The symbol varies with different men. The undiscovered country beyond it, the never-never land, the land of heart's desire. Lewis taught me its meaning. He calls it simply the island. Whatever we call it, it is more than our home than any earthly country. This desire was welling up in her heart, and Lewis met her at that place. Lewis describes this yearning that is embedded in each one of us, doesn't he? Seeking its proper object as part of what it means to experience joy. And so he frequently appeals to this idea of another home, a place of desire, a place that we long for in each and every one of us experience of this kind of exile. But the Jewish people specifically experienced this exile, this homelessness, this wandering, this search for home. And she was resonating with that exile in her search for a place, a place of home, a longing deeply entrenched in the Jewish imagination, in joy's imagination. We often feel that we are in exile, don't we? Somewhere other than home. We weren't meant for another, we were meant for another place. Jewish exile and dispersion explain why there is this incredible and intense desire to belong to an ideal community in an ideal place. We feel homeless. We don't belong. This world can't satisfy that. It won't do it. It can't do it. It was never meant to do it. The yearning for a homeland has been the constant prayer and identity marker of the Jewish people since the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. And Joy inherited that desire, that sense of exile, the yearning for a place. Eventually, as Joy put it, God came in. 
making her the world's most astonished atheist. <laughs> After this experience, she set about reconstructing the way she thought about herself and the world, and this was her logic. If God were truly, if God were true, then her thinking before had been wrong. If my knowledge of God was not true, the thinking of my whole life has been false. This was a painful process for her, this process of realization. But she did it as a Jew. She thought like a Jew. She processed all of this like a Jew. This yearning persists for no other reason. That home, in its highest form, is elusive. It's elsewhere. <laughs> the centuries-old yearning was the narrative that Joy found herself in. A Jewish yearning. How shall we sing the Lord's song? in a strange land, Psalm 137. She reread the New Testament. She studied world religions, and this is what she said. I found them anything but the same thing. Some of them had wisdom up to a point. Some of them had good ethical intentions. Some of them had flashes of spiritual insight. But only one of them had complete understanding of the grace and repentance and charity that had come to me from God. She reread the New Testament, studied world religions, and then she said, the Redeemer who'd made himself known, whose personality I would have recognized among 10,000. Well, when I read the New Testament, I recognized him. He was Jesus. So she fell in love with him. Her Jewishness told her that in considering the truth of Jesus' claims, she was doing something terrible. She was an apostate. She writes that when she thought, what she thought of, that she simply wanted to become a Jew of the Reformed persuasion, a liberal Jew, an open-minded Jew, a pluralistic Jew. That's what she always assumed she would turn into. Instead, she fell in love with Jesus, the Jewish Messiah. She was excessively uncomfortable, given her Jewishness. The Jew, she said, who enters Christianity is always haunted by ghosts, she would write years later. Voices out of his past assure him that he's making a fool of himself, betraying his tradition and his ancestry. He must keep arguing constantly, defending the truth of his new faith against the jeering shadows in his mind. Haunted by ghosts and jeering shadows, our conversions have brought us into a new world. Her correspondence during this time shows that she wrestled with her Jewish identity in relation to her newfound theism and subsequent belief in Jesus. This identity struggle is familiar to many Jews who follow Jesus. Her attitude toward Jews and Judaism in some correspondence is biting and critical and angry, very much in line with her personality. She's very critical of her friends, her Jewish friends, atheists, who have abandoned Judaism, who hate Christianity, she calls this kind of thinking the ethos of the ghetto Jew. But she says this, I think that because I'm born a Jew, I have the right to say that a man ought to be free to criticize Jews. <laughs> so she's saying, look, this is a family fight. This is my family. I'm going to fight with them. We, uh, we did crucify Christ. The Romans wouldn't have given a damn. And what's worse, we did is the people reject him. Although, of course, throughout history, innumerable Jews have accepted him and cease to exist as Jews. But then, as you say, everybody is always crucifying Christ. For their rejection, the Jews have paid and are continuing to pay the spiritually heartbreaking, spiritual heartbreak of basing their culture on false premises. This is really hard stuff. The, the persecutions, horrible enough, though not so unremitting as Jews imagine, are only the result of the Jews' willful self-isolation. She's not anti-Semitic, she's a Jew. She thinks that Jewish people are paranoid about Christians while knowing next to nothing about the religion. She describes the decrying of anti-Semitism as a kind of new Jewish religion. Remember, this is a family fight. She's an insider speaking about her own people. The notion of chosenness is in several letters. She asks rhetorically why the Jews are chosen. She answers, chosen to suffer. In a letter, this is the letter I'm talking about, 
She said she was asked to address the London church on the problem of the Christian Jew. And then she says, mm, the Goyim, the Gentiles, should have my problem yet. The sermon is titled, Chosen for What? That is the sermon that I discovered. It's subtitled, The Problem of the Christian Jew. The sermon starts with an illustrative story about a man who visits his dead daughter's grave in a Catholic cemetery. The implication is that she converted to Catholicism and she married a Catholic man. She calls the story Rai because as a Jewish believer in Jesus, our conversions have brought us into a new world. But the old world, the world of childhood and familiar habits and lifelong friends, the world which has given us our unconscious attitudes towards life, we are something worse than dead in its eyes. Intermarriage to the majority of Jews is bad enough. Apostasy is far worse. Jewish children are taught that Christianity is the enemy. She contends that the Jewish believer in Jesus must give up a set of cultural attitudes. This seems unfortunate, but understandable. In her generation, she felt like she was an outsider in the Jewish community. In this sermon, we see the centrality of Jewishness in her orientation and in her attitude. She believes that Jewishness is to be respected and it's to be appraised. Her conclusion is related to the problem of sin and selfishness and recognizing the problem of pride. But the intensity of her personality and the turbulent relationship with her Jewishness comes through at this time in her letters and correspondence. Her Jewishness was a fact of her own particular social development, education and identification, and sometimes of her strained religious affiliation. So if you read this stuff, you have to take that into consideration. She was a Jew. She wrote as a family member to other family members. He, she grapples endlessly with her Jewish identity in relation to her faith. When it comes to the specifics of her identity, there's ongoing uncertainty. This identity tension was part and parcel of living as a first-generation Jew in North America. When she becomes a Christian, a whole new identity, which impacted this Jewish identity. The result was a tribal confusion, which manifested in internal and external opposition and pressure, and often she'd react very stridently in her letters. Joy experienced a new reading and interpretation of sacred history, texts and lineage. At the same time, the deep structural shift that occurred within her worldview caused some of her respondents to become strangers. And so she lost friendships during this time because of the stridency of her letters and her correspondence. We perceive in her a sense of loss, but also a sense of peace. Her words cannot be self-hating anti-Semitism. Jeremiah says that his people are wicked, faithless, and fools. <laughs> Was he an anti-Semite? She writes well within this tradition. The Jewish prophets established a moral tradition. And so we see and enjoy the same thing. Intramural and extramural intensity that comes with it. She spoke the truth that was derived from divine inspiration and moral conviction. This prophetic impetus was built into her personality and it was built into her faith. Lewis sees in her writing a kind of ferocity that is Jewish and prophetic, modern and feminine, feminine and can be very quiet, the paw looked as if it were velveted till we felt the scratch. <laughs> that was Joy. Lewis once said that Joy grew up Jewish in blood, rationalistic in her convictions. Lewis called her a Semitic genius. <laughs> Very interesting. For many contemporaries, God, now look at this sentence, it's fantastic. For many contemporaries, God has dwindled into a noble distraction, a tendency of history, a goal of evolution. He has thinned out into a concept useful for organizing world peace, a good thing as an idea, but not the word made flesh, who dies for us and rose again from the dead. Oh my goodness. I wish I could write a paragraph like that. <laughs> not a personality that a man can feel any love for, and not certainly the eternal lover who took the initiative and fell in love with us. So you know she writes soft and hard, right? Soft and hard. David Min is operating in the custom of the prophets. Isaiah 17, you've forgotten God, your Savior. 
You've not remembered the rock, your fortress, and Jeremiah. Remember the Lord in a distant land and call to mind Jerusalem. She operates in the custom of the prophets, then in the nations where they have been carried captive, those who escape will remember me. David, her son, begins to embrace a more traditional Jewish identity. Conflict with Joy, who is ambivalent. He's offended by her sensibilities. He studies Hebrew and began to speak with an Eastern European accent perhaps as a reaction to Joy and her brother's purposeful abandoning of their own accents at their father's urging. He was critical of the book Smoke on the Mountain because she called on her heritage as a Jew, and this offended David. He felt that she'd gotten the traditional understanding of the commandments wrong. In his letters, David says that Joy reads Yiddish and other literature in Yiddish, reads works of Jewish interests, loved Jewish jokes, supported Israel, denounced anti-Semitism, went to Jewish restaurants, <laughs> was afraid of not being able to check into hotels because she was Jewish. So David writes this about joy in his letters. But he also said that this, in spite of her apostasy, she remained decidedly, if not decidedly, Jewish. Now what does that mean? Decidedly, if not decidedly, Jewish. He's speaking ironically, I think, saying that she remained a true Jew in character and temperament, specifically because of her obstinacy. <laughs> Perhaps he's being a bit tongue-in-cheek in a self-deprecating way. The deicide reference is odd, as if he's making a pointed reference to her embracing of Jesus, as if she was somehow trying to be let off the hook from the frequent accusations of being a Christ killer that are aimed towards Jews like David. David Gresham. Joy did support David's interest in Judaism. She arranged for him to have a Jewish education. In speaking of his grandparents' reaction to Joy becoming a Christian, he says, naturally, they thought my mother's conversion was silly. Since they didn't believe in their own religion, they thought it was idiotic to accept somebody else's. <laughs> but since their attachment to Judaism was so weak, they were not enraged in the way in which most Jews would have been. David calls one of Joy's friends, J.B. Stern, an apostate Jewess like my mother. In a letter dated January 9, 1977, David credits Lewis for impacting his life, but also says in the same letter that Lewis was an anti-Semite. <laughs> that he was anti-Semitic is not surprising. It is probably concomitant with his devout Christianity. For the failures of Jesus' contemporaries to accept him as the Messiah, must be something that requires a bit of explaining for Christians. So just by the fact that he was a committed Christian meant he was an anti-Semite. But between son and the mother complex and relationship exists. The issues that separated them are ones that Jewish believers in Jesus and their families have wrestled with. David loved Judaism since he was 11, and with his mother's death, his interest grew. Lewis arranged for David to take private lessons in Hebrew, and David started attending the Oxford Synagogue. So finally, her legacy, she, was, she said that she regarded the apostates with traditional Jewish horror. She became the person that she dreaded. She speaks of God hounding her. She was convinced and convicted of her sin and found God's grace in the person of Jesus. When she began speaking and writing publicly of her faith, it angered and embarrassed some of her friends and relatives. Her brother was especially hurt, and their relationship was never the same. This is a very funny story. She went to a Presbyterian church in upstate New York, and it was a very traditional church. And after the sermon, the pastor would step in the back, and people would file out and shake hands and say, very nice sermon, very nice sermon, very nice sermon. But Joy would always stop and shake the hand of the pastor and then complain about his apologetics and hermeneutics <laughs> and complain about his interpretive process. And she would do this all the time, and the poor pastor saw her coming. <laughs> and once she did this, and she invited her brother to come to church, and she did it with her brother then, and he was horrified. <laughs> she followed in the tradition of the prophets not being welcome in their own country, who spoke as family as insiders to people who preferred not to listen. She wrote this, the apostles always seemed to come from Missouri. <laughs> 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 they wanted to be shown, right? The show me state. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
It took me a while to figure that out. <laughs> but also, she meant that she, they didn't really know what was going on. She had a glimpse of what was going on, but she was constantly an outsider. She was homeless. Like the patriarchs before her, she was a foreigner and a stranger. First to Gentiles and then to Jewish people, but she fought to make herself a better person and the world a better place. She continued to be overwhelmed with ambivalence about her Jewish identity. Her questions and doubts and temper did not nullify her faith. They reinforced the purpose of redemption. Joy had abundantly good reasons to reject Christianity. She was able to get to the place as many contemporary Jewish believers do, where she saw the difference between rejecting Christians and not Jesus himself. She fell in love with Jesus. Jewish believers in Jesus look to her, and they can resonate with her identity crisis. Traditional, secular Jews may look to her as a renegade and an apostate, but they'd have a hard time not seeing her intelligence, her wit, and her Jewishness. Joy was loved and loathed by many people. This may have been because of her consistent and continuing loyalty to the legacy of her Jewish heritage, expressed in a very forceful and strident way. She maintained her own unique connection to Jewish tradition that was articulated in her life and in her work. She died at 45 years old. A terrible loss for Lewis, for her family, for the church, for the Jewish community, and for us. Imagine if she could have lived till she was 80 or 90, we could have met her. She was strident, forceful, and noisy. In her award-winning story, Apostate, Joy closes the circle on her Jewish identity as she writes poignantly of the conflicted hero, Chanya. No matter what Chanya decides, and no matter how she lives, and how she decides to pursue her dreams, her body would always belong to the synagogue, and her body would still be Chanya. She will always be a Jew. Thank you. We now have an opportunity for some questions. My co-director, David Downing, will pass the mic. Be sure you wait until you get the mic so that we can hear your questions on the recording. David? You said to the end, Joy, held on to her Jewishness. In a sentence or two, what was she holding on to? She was holding on mm -hmm. to the connection that she had, knowing that her body was Jewish, that her ancestors were Jewish, that she was connected to Moses and the prophets physically and spiritually. I think she knew that. She was a, a, a follower of the God of Israel and his Messiah Jesus, a child of Abraham, not only by faith, but a child of Abraham by flesh. Be before she became a Christian and she was an atheist, she was still holding on to her Jewishness. Was that thinking of Abraham? I don't think so, but I think she had this strong attachment to her ancestors. She knew that her body was Jewish, and she wondered what that meant, and that's why she took on uh, this spiritual hunger, and she wanted to be a communist. She wanted to make the world a better place, and that's tied into this notion of tikkun olam, repairing the world. So her impetus, her heart, her impulses were Jewish. Are, uh, are her two sons still alive? And if so, uh, uh, do you know um, how they're doing, what they're... Well, David passed away David did. three years ago, and Doug is still living. I, I don't know where he lives, but Doug is still living, and he's still very helpful to me, and I know to the Wade Center, and I've asked him a lot of questions uh, in my research, and he's been very helpful. He's been in Malta and he's moving to the Isle of Wight right now, I think. Great okay. friend of the Wade Center. Can I ask you to repeat something you said at dinner about the difference, a Jewish conception of sin and, and the sinner versus a Christian conception? 
So in Judaism, um, you're a sinner because you sin. In Christianity, you sin because you're a sinner. <laughs> so there are two completely different ways of looking at things, an orientation or an action. Well, I don't know what that has to do with joy, but... <laughs> <laughs> But it's obviously something that she had to come to terms with as well. I mean, because in Judaism, man is innocent. And so trying to come to terms with the fact that if we're innocent, then what do we need to be forgiven for? What's the purpose of, of redemption? So the notion of sin, salvation, and savior, they sort of become very opaque if you're innocent. There's a question in the back. Did she identify more with the Orthodox Jews or the conservative Jews or the uh, contemporary ones? And secondly, um, with regard to the Jews being the chosen ones, what was her take on the Jews being the chosen ones? Well, like I said, you know, her notion of chosenness was somehow was, was kind of distorted and she thought that we were, that Jews were chosen to suffer. Um, and she saw the suffering often at the hands of the people who were who claimed to be Christians. She didn't really identify with any specific denomination. I think she saw herself more in the lines of a liberal Jew who saw um, her, her vocation in life to make, it was to make the world a better place. And the focus of most of modern Jewry is focused around this notion of repairing the world, what we call tikkun olam, um, which is a kind of a driving force which is central to most Jewish thinking that our, the purpose of being Jewish is to make the world a better place. And I think she saw herself very much in that tradition. And then when she became a believer in Jesus, she saw herself in the tradition of the prophets. And then what high school did she go to? I don't know. <laughs> All right. she, I, I know she went to Hunter College. You know, where did she go to high school? You know? Oh, that's, you have a question. Mm -hmm. I thought you were some, you were a Davidman scholar. <laughs> Does anybody know where she went to high school? Somewhere in the Bronx. Um, this isn't really a question, but just kind of a statement of what I got from her that how, how beautiful it is for a Jewish person to see that you could be a Jew who loves Jesus and still be so proud of your Jewish identity. You know? So I'd really recommend um, Abby's biography and then Doug, Don King's book of her letters and her, um, her poetry. Um, I don't know if you could recommend anything else, you know, that would be for a that would be most easily accessible to people. Well, Lyle Dorsett, who's a former director of the Wade Center, wrote a very good short biography, which is really helpful. Right, okay. Becoming Mrs. Lewis. Becoming Mrs. Oh. Lewis. Is like historical fiction? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, so. She wrote that she read the New Testament and fell in love with Jesus. Did she ever express what was it that first grabbed her attention about uh, this unique personality? I think she was just spiritually hungry, and in her reading of the New Testament, she fell in love, you know, with the Redeemer. And she had this, this overwhelming sense that he was the Jewish Messiah. Did she see her faith um, in Christ as a fulfillment of her Judaism, or did she feel like she was betraying her Judaism, do you think? Both. Both? Yeah. So she was very, very ambivalent. I think I know the answer to this, but was she um, very much involved in the institutional church, the Christian church? I think she was involved in a, in a Presbyterian church in upstate New York. I don't know if she was a member, but I know she wrote for the Presbyterian Journal um, in, the fo in the 50s. But I don't think she, ha I, w was she a member of that church? I don't know. You, she was? You don't know? Right, it was a Presbyterian church. Okay. I don't know. Um, and then I wanted to comment, when she's talking about arguing with the family, I'm a Roman Catholic and we do the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> so it's okay, I can say anything, but you know, it's when the others, and uh, I just recently was studying the book of Exodus and, and then you know many times with the prophets and I just really, 
understood what you were talking about in her wanting to to speak that way, you know, and like you're quoting Jeremiah, and yeah, that's what you do. You, well, it's you family. You criticize yourself. You, when you speak to your family, it's different than when you speak to outsiders. So Jeremiah was speaking to family. Um, Joy was speaking to family, and so she took liberty with that. So if you, if you read her information and you quote it, just be careful, because it's very, very strident. How did she meet C.S. Lewis? She met him through his correspondence. And then, and then you, as you said, the movie was accurate, I believe, in that she wrote to him and invited herself <laughs> to meet him. <laughs> and do, do you know how she passed away? Cancer. One final question. What did you say the difference between the Jewish concept of sin and the Christian <laughs> concept of sin? In Judaism, you're a sinner because you sin. It's an action. In the Christian religion, you're a sinner. Y you, you sin because you're a sinner. It's an orientation. So it's a completely different way. It's a completely different worldview, um, which is the heart and soul of trying to reach my people, is that worldview, that orientation is very, very different. It is, yes. Was Joy Davidman's um, Jewishness um, how did that impact C.S. Lewis's writings? Is it identifiable that he started writing in maybe in, in, in with a different sensibility about that? Yeah, I think uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not a Lewis scholar, but I think s you know some of the folks here, we talked about it at dinner, and we were wondering you know, about some of his later works because, sh because Lewis and Davidman, you know, I think they would edit each other. And, and I think in Letters to Malcolm specifically, there's this sense in which Davidman is kind of over his shoulder, right? <laughs> Saying things. Um, so I think in many ways she was his equal, if not his superior. And so, I mean, for me it's just a terrible loss to imagine what they could have produced in 10 or 20 more years of life together. But I, but I think in many ways, I think Lewis scholars would agree that she did have a profound influence on him. Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. Do we, are we okay with time? Was Joy a believer before she met Lewis? Because you said there were, or she said that there were pictures of a family in front of a Presbyterian church in New York. So like, which came first? I mean, how could she be in New York in a church, but then meet Lewis uh, in Yeah, Oxford? maybe some of you can help me with that timeline. I'm not exactly sure what the timeline is. He became a believer partly through reading Lewis's books. Yes. So he didn't realize that by writing these books, he's helping prepare his future wife <laughs> to be his partner. <laughs> but her, his books were very Im, uh, influential in her conversion. And so by 52, she really wanted to meet him in person. So right. she took so her 52. two sons over. Right. Yeah. So she was already a believer yes. in New York. Yes. 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 What's the story on uh, the divorce from her first husband? <laughs> I don't think they had a happy marriage. <laughs> um, but I, I, uh, I mean, you'll see it in the biographies, and you know, uh, and she was she was very unhappy. I, I think he had a problem drinking, um, and then she was she was drawn to Lewis, and then she brought her children to England, and then she decided to settle there. But I think they had a profoundly unhappy marriage. But I don't know exactly the timeline of the unhappiness and why it was unhappy. But I think if you read Abby's biography, I think there's some detail in that, mm -hmm. and which I don't remember. He was an alcoholic and a screenwriter, so that's two strikes. <laughs> <laughs> she was a screenwriter as well. Oh. Um. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned she was inspired by medieval Jewish writing? Well, the, the, the Judaism of her parents was medieval. It would be Moses Mendelssohn, or it was just, you said philosophical. Yeah, it was it was a philosophical and medieval Judaism that they inherited. You have to remember that her grandparents and her parents lived in the same area for generations, so they inherited this this medieval thinking, not in a negative way, but in a positive way. It was it was the center and the focus of their life and their worldview that they inherited for generations and generations off in these little villages. You know, maybe you've seen Fiddler on the Roof. Oh, yes. It's that kind of family, and they, okay. they imported that into the Bronx, into this multicultural environment, and it just collapsed. And so that 
they wanted to get rid of that otherness because they were in the village, they were all the same, but in the Bronx, they were all different. So that's why they taught themselves to lose the accent, though the heavy, right. thick Polish accent. They didn't want to be seen as other. They wanted to have the opportunities and the choice that America afforded them. And the anti-Semitism of the day was social and it was political and financial and educational, and it repulsed them. Did she interact with any other Jewish writers, say Barbara Tuckman, in correspondence? Or I, don't, I don't know. When she was young, she was good friends with Bell Kaufman, who wrote Up the Down Staircase, is that right? Oh, right, right. So, yeah, she had some really important uh, female relationships when she was young with fellow Jews. Dr. Barron, um, I have two questions. One is early on you'd mentioned um, that she read a lot of fantasy as a youth. I'm curious if you can say some of the authors she read. I know she'd read George MacDonald. I don't <laughs> know if there were others, um, but I'd love it if you have any color on that. And then secondly, how I, I don't. I have oh. to defer. I didn't say yes on George MacDonald. <laughs> yeah, I knew George <laughs> MacDonald, but I don't know others. And, and then secondly, do we know how old she was when she first read the New Testament? And then what was her reaction to it when she read it for the first time? I'm just curious, uh, given uh, her background, <laughs> how, she, how she reacted, and if she read it as a young age, given what a prodigy she was. Yeah, I mean, but she, uh, the quote that I have, so you have to remember that, that all of this research is from just various letters that are spread out across time that are trying to form a chronology. But she did study world religions. And we see that when she read the New Testament, it's, it was set apart in her heart, that there was something different about it. And the Savior, the Messiah, the Redeemer sort of jumped out of the page and touched her. And she said it was just different. I don't know if there's any more than that in her letters, and so maybe some of you might know. I don't. Sorry? What did you do with that sermon that you found? It's unpublished, um, so I was given permission to have a copy. So if I give it to you, I think they'll have to kill me. I think, is Marion here? Marge. Marge, sorry, Marge. Marjorie. We're in conversation <laughs> about that. <laughs> Obviously, a lot of work needs to be done, and we've invited Dr. Barron to write an introduction to this and provide um, an interpretive paradigm, so we really do want to work with him on that. I also want to encourage you, there are a lot of questions about details of Joy's life, there are two fantastic books that we have out at the desk on sale, and you, I recommend reading both. I did one right after the other because they give two different perspectives. One is Abby Santa Maria's biography called Joy, and she includes a lot of the people who responded negatively to Joy because as Dr. Barron says, she, she was strident. She just expressed exactly what she <laughs> thought. She was very unusual, uh, not only for that time, but for this time, that she didn't care what people thought about her. And so you'll get these quotations where you go, whoa, I can't <laughs> believe she said that. But then we have someone who wrote this historical novel but it's written in the first person from Joy's perspective. So it gives you a sense of how what Joy was thinking and why she was saying the things she was saying. And so reading them in tandem is a wonderful education. Both of the women who wrote those did a lot of research at the Wade before they generated their books and I recommend them highly. So again, they are out at that front desk. <coughs> yeah. Okay, so one last question. Yeah, I'm not a Davidman scholar. I was kind of focusing and drilling down on one very specific aspect of Joy's life and trying to kind of bring that out and tickle that out. According to this excellent source, the archival collections at Wheaton College, <laughs> it says that Joy Davidman 
complete, uh, graduated from Evander Childs High School at the age of 14. <laughs> And she read, she read books at home until she entered Hunter College at 15. Right. She graduated in ni at 19 and, and then in 1934 and then in 1935 she was awarded a master's degree in English literature from Columbia University. Yeah, yeah she was amazing. Thanks. So when I hear something like that, it just breaks my heart because she died when she was 45. Yeah. <laughs> My closing thought would be, if you don't believe God has a sense of humor, imagine him talking to C.S. Lewis, the confirmed bachelor in 1950, and say, you will get married, she will be an American, she'll be Jewish, <laughs> she'll be a divorcee, <laughs> and her name will be Joy. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks so much for coming out tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Remember to join us on August 1st to hear from this artist. And as you go out, you can see the painting, and I challenge you to see if you can find the lamb. <laughs> <laughs>